So the goal of proof of stake random sampling should seem pretty simple. So let me just briefly re remind you what it is. You can think of the input as a list of the active validators. So validators that are currently participating in consensus, a validator is identified by its public key um, and is associated with some amount of stake. So that list is available uh, in some designated staking contract. And all we want to do is sample one of the public keys in this list with probability proportional to uh, stake, probability proportional to the Q sub i's. So, for example, if you're one of the validators and amongst all of the locked up state, 1% of it is owned by you, uh, then you would like to be selected with 1% probability. Now, remember, why is it that we want this property? Why do we want to sample um, with probability proportional to stake? Well, that gives us uh, civil resistance, right? Because this means the probability of a, that a node is selected um, is independent of how many IDs it uses. It doesn't matter if it's using one public key or many public keys. Its selection probability depends just on the overall amount of stake uh, that it's committing. Also, with sampling proportional to stake, um, it becomes quite clear what kind of assumptions we're going to need to make bounding uh, the power of the adversary. Uh, it's going to be just on the fraction of the stake that's controlled by Byzantine nodes. So for a BFT type consensus protocol, you'd expect us to assume that a, uh, less than a third of the overall stake is controlled by Byzantine nodes. For a longest chain protocol, you'd expect the assumption to be less than half uh, of the stake controlled by Byzantine nodes. So speaking of consensus protocols, how are you actually going to use such a random sampling procedure in a consensus protocol? Well, one obvious thing to do with it is to sample a leader, so a block proposer uh, for a given round. So remember, both longest chain consensus and most BFT type protocols like Tendermint, there's a notion of a round and there's a notion of a single designated node that acts as the leader that kicks off the round with a block proposal. So in effect, you can interpret such a random sampling procedure as reducing the problem of designing a permissionless consensus protocol to a problem we've already solved, namely designing a permissioned uh, consensus protocol, right? Permissionless longest chain is just permissioned longest chain plus the civil resistant random sampling to choose a leader in each round. Similarly for BFT type consensus, you just sort of stand on the shoulders of the permissioned version, but again, using this random sampling pr procedure to choose a leader in each round. Now for a BFT type protocol, you also have to figure out um, which active validators are allowed to vote um, on a block proposal. Um, and you know we'll talk more about the details of how to do that in a, in a separate video about coupling um, proof of stake civil resistance with BFT type consensus. For now, for simplicity, if you want, just imagine that like all of the all of the validators, so all of PK1 through PKN, um, are allowed to vote on block proposals um, with their vote weighted by the amount of stake. So a super majority um, in a BFT type protocol would mean that uh, more than two thirds of the overall stake uh, is voting uh, to proceed with a particular block. So that's again what's the key defining property of proof of stake. Um, those are the reasons why we want it, and that's how we'd obviously make use of it in a consensus protocol. Um, and you look at this, you're like, how hard could it be, right? There's just some explicitly defined distribution that the protocol is well aware of, and all it has to do is randomly pick um, a sample from that distribution. Well, here's a fact, and this should not necessarily be uh, intuitive. Um, it is actually surprisingly tricky to do this in the context of a blockchain protocol. So indeed, every proof of stake blockchain protocol sort of handles this, implements this uh, a bit differently. And actually with each new generation of proof of stake blockchain protocols, we're seeing sort of increasingly sophisticated, but also increasingly sound um, solutions to pulling off um, proof of stake random sampling. One example would be if you just look at the iterations of the proposed proof of stake version of Ethereum over the years, um, you will see sort of it getting increasingly complex, but also increasingly robust to wider and wider sets of, of possible manipulations. And the state of the art is very much still evolving. So speaking here at the beginning of 2023, I don't think we've reached the end game um, of how to implement proof of stake uh, random sampling. So my goal here then is going to be sort of the highlight the state of the art such as, such as it is uh, for this problem. And in particular, to make sure you understand, you know, what are the key challenges and the currently available uh, palette of solutions. 
so again, you might find this fact um, surprising. Like, why is it so so hard? Um, so I owe you an answer to that. Um, there's actually a couple answers, but the answer I want to focus on now and for the next many number of videos um, is the challenge of generating randomness from the hermetically sealed blockchain environment. So what do I mean by that? Well, imagine a blockchain protocol wanted some randomness, like it wanted the outcomes of some fair coin flips. Uh, let's think through where that randomness might come from. And let's think about it separately for the proof of work and proof of stake cases. Now in proof of work, the protocol basically gets randomness for free by an external process, okay? namely the mining process um, of would-be block producers sort of tr repeatedly trying nonces uh, and trying to find a solution to one of these hard crypto puzzles. So a proof of work protocol really just is given a random sample from the outside, namely whichever um, node is, whichever public key is the first one to report a solution to a crypto puzzle, that's the public key that in effect gets selected uh, in a given round. And under our usual random oracle assumption that a cryptographic hash function like SHA-256 is for all practical purposes equivalent to a gnome in a box just flipping fair coins, um, that means that miners can't, they really don't have any other strategy than just repeatedly guessing distinct nonces hoping to get lucky. Um, and given that, given that that's the only thing the miners are capable of doing, they also are incapable of manipulating the probability with which they get selected. It's just a sort of undeniable fact that you're going to be selected with probability proportional to the fraction of guesses, the fraction of hashes that you are generating. With the proof of stake blockchain protocol, meanwhile, uh, there's no clear analog to this external mining process, which for proof of work is in effect um, providing the protocol with uh, fair coin flips. In the proof of stake world, it would seem, you know, you're kind of stuck, the protocol is stuck trying to generate randomness knowing the only stuff that it knows about, stuff from within its hermetically sealed environment, in other words, from the current state of the protocol. So a couple of comments. Um, so first comment is the key challenge we're talking about here, it's actually not specific to the fact we're trying to sample from the stake distribution. Um, the exact same issues would come up if you were trying to sample from any sort of known distribution known to the protocol, namely, you know, where are you gonna get your randomness from? So the issue is more general, but we're obviously um, interested specifically in the case of sampling from a, a staking distribution. Um, the second comment is you could in principle try to import randomness somehow um, from outside uh, the blockchain protocol. But the question then is like, you know, who is allowed to inject that randomness um, into the proof of stake protocol? Uh, and how do you know that that person actually generated that randomness appropriately and didn't manipulate it in any way? So if you have some party that you're willing to trust to reliably uh, submit actual um, true randomness to a blockchain protocol, then a lot of the issues we're gonna talk about in this video, not all of them, but a lot of the issues in this video uh, are going to go away. So one can imagine, you know, a proof of stake blockchain protocol that does make this trust assumption to sort of avoid all these issues with generating its own randomness. Uh, in practice, however, if you look at all of the major deployed proof of stake protocols, uh, they do not, in fact, trust an external source uh, for randomness. They do, in fact, generate it internally. So the issues we're going to discuss in the next several lectures are very, very relevant um, to the current state of the art. So this new key challenge, right, which we did not have in the proof of work world, in the proof of work world, we just had under the random oracle assumption, um, this non-manipulable source of external randomness. In the proof of stake world, uh, that randomness is going to be derived from the blockchain state. And that opens up a new attack vector that we really just did not have to worry about before, right? So if randomness is being derived from the blockchain state, that means you could manipulate the randomness potentially by manipulating the blockchain state. Who is it that's in charge of maintaining the blockchain state? Well, that is exactly the validators themselves. They're the ones uh, producing and, and finalizing blocks. So it is now possible we have to worry about validators potentially manipulating the blockchain state, for example, by choosing the contents or metadata of a block proposal appropriately. So manipulating the blockchain state in order to, for example, make it so that it or its friends are going to be selected as leaders more frequently in the future than they would have been otherwise. All right, so I hope the intuition behind this challenge is clear, right? So proof of stake, no obvious external random process. Uh, we're not willing to sort of trust some third party to supply randomness. We really want just the protocol to be able to generate the randomness itself. Where can it get that randomness? Well, it has to be from something it knows about. And basically all it knows about is its own blockchain state. 
But if randomness is derived from blockchain states, then you worry about manipulation of that randomness through the manipulation um, of the blockchain state by block producers. So that is the this is the natural place to conclude part one, um, because all of the next bunch of videos, all of the part two videos, they're exactly about understanding and addressing this challenge. How do you have randomness so that the manipulation probabilities uh, are few to none um, for the block producers participating in the protocol? So that's where we're going to start next. I'll see you there.